meeting of the Reading Municipal Light Department, Board of Commissioners, is uh, should be getting broadcast live. But it's not going to be broadcast live tonight. It will be uh, shown uh, in the towns of Reading, North Reading, Wilmington, and Linfield when the technology uh, constraints are solved. RMLD Board of Commissioners recognizes the importance of hearing public comment at the discretion of the chair on items on the official agenda as well as on items not on the official agenda. We ask that all questions or comments from the public be directed to the chair and that all parties, including members of the RMLD board, act in a professional and courteous manner when addressing the board or responding to comments. Once recognized by the chair, all persons addressing the board shall state their name and address prior to speaking. It is the role of the chair to maintain order in all public comment or ensuing discussion. Um, I'd like to um, acknowledge Marcy West, selectman uh, from the town of Reading. Uh, the cab representative, uh, Dave Mancuso was unable to be here due to, due to a family emergency. We hope everything is okay with uh, Dave. Um, also like to acknowledge Patty Cruz, the senior project manager from Lidos, who will be making a presentation on our organizational study. And Ken McNeil, uh, vice president of systems planning uh, with Booth and Associates, who will be making the presentation on the reliability study. And Phil Ficino will be the board secretary tonight. Okay. So we move on to public comment if there is um, well, it says ask that public comment be deferred until after the presentation. Um, is that important to the board, or could we do public comment? I, I is there any public comment? I think I think we have one member of the public here. I'm I'm happy to have the public comment be now rather than waiting until after the presentations. It's if you. No, I, I, I don't need the public oh, okay, fine. <laughs> then it's a moot question. Okay. Um, uh, okay. So I guess that's that. Um, so with that, why don't we kick off the presentation? for the uh, Organizational and Reliability Study uh, with Patty Cruz. Thank you, good evening. Again, as stated, my name is Patty Cruz and I will serve as the project manager for the organizational assessment. What I have prepared for you is um, the overview of our scope of work and how we intend to accomplish this. But before I dive into that, I also want to introduce to you Steve Rupp, who is with Lidos and he's the vice president with the company that wh who will act as client liaison for the project. The way we've uh, organized the presentation today, we wanted to give you an introduction of who we are at Lidos. Just to give you a background, I don't think we have worked in recent past together. So it's, it'll start with an introduction of the company. We'll then dive into the team that we've assembled in order to be able to provide the services that you've needed. The qualifications is just to show you an example of what we do, and we'll briefly go through all that till we finally get to the scope of work. And so, the Lidos Engineering Legacy. Steve? Well, good evening, Commissioners, and, and thank you again for the opportunity to, to be here in Redding. Um, I started off my week in Redding, California, on the other side of the mm -hmm. USA, where we're doing a uh, organizational study as well. Uh, it's a very strange coincidence, and one that makes me giggle. Uh, but we're, we're certainly happy to be here. We've spent a very good day with uh, the manager team and talked about what we're I wanted to share with you just briefly a little bit of our history. Um, uh, Lidos is a fairly new company. We were founded one year ago, uh, but how we got there is built on a long legacy of engineering and consulting and public power. Uh, Patty and I both come from a company called R.W. Beck. R.W. Beck has been around uh, for a lot of years, uh, started in public power, ended in public power. In 2007, we were bought by a company called Science Applications International, SAIC. Uh, after five years, SAIC split into two publicly traded companies, uh, uh, Lidos being the new, uh, the new corporation that was born. Within Lidos lives the same core group of people that uh, have worked together, Patty and I, for 15 years now or so on strategic planning and organizational assessments for public power entities. So I think we bring a lot of experience, a lot of capabilities to the table, and we really look forward to working with your team and bring it back uh, to you uh, some information to help you uh, make some good decisions for the future of the utility. We wanted to, as Steve elaborated, we have a breadth of experience. And so for the organizational assessment, sometimes we see the need to bring subject matter expertise. And so this is just to provide you with an overview of how we always are trying to think about an integrated solution. We recognize that a utility is a system and it touches upon many points, so that's just to illustrate that. 
And then Steve briefly touched upon Lao Lido's engineering. We have about 3,000 employees dedicated to engineering solutions, uh, over 1,000 employees with advanced degrees, and those are our office locations. I am in Austin, Texas. <laughs> Your team. This is where we start diving into what we've prepared for you. The reason why I'm the project manager is because of my background. I have, uh, well, I've been in the utility industry for 15 years, but what I focus on is helping utility organizations improve their performance, their efficiency, their efficacy. So um, that's what I'm bringing to the table. When we saw the RFP for Reading, we started thinking about what were some of the needs that we needed to make sure to incorporate to our team. So invited Lisa Vetter. She is out of our Orlando office. Her background is she's an industrial engineer, but she also has a forte in financial aspects. So we've invited her to participate in the, in the project team because of her utility experience and also because there was one aspect of the RFP that got into the physical space, the layout of the facility. So she's going to be contributing to that. Matthew Eckhart, he is our, our young analyst. We're excited about having him on the team because he brings that fresh set of eyes. You may have experienced that in the utility industry, many of us have been in there working for a long time, and it's always important to be that continuous improvement aspect. And so Matt ha is a recent graduate, and he brings with him what's, what's the next thing? What are some of the things or technologies, tools that are being developed that we wanted to make sure to bring to the, to the table? Rebecca Shifley is our market research person. I have worked with Rebecca for over 15 years, and so she has uh, supported me in many organizational assessments and strategic plans, and because of her marketing research background, she will be contributing with the industry best practices and benchmarking. So that's the team we have assembled for you. These are just some of the experience or the capabilities that we wanted to highlight it, uh, that we can bring to the table. As an example, when we do organizational assessments, these are just two that were described, and there's others that we described in our proposal. But for example, Brownsville Public Utilities Board, a utility in Texas, I've had the, the honor of working with them since 1999. And we've gone through several organizational assessments. It is very interesting to see how a utility can change. The transformation that's required starts with leadership, but we look at other aspects of the process, performance, uh, staffing, capabilities. And so these are just two examples of how we've seen over the years the success from, you know, it starts with looking at the, at the x-ray of what the utility looks like now and needs to design, the design that needs to happen so that it can move into the future. And so now let's dive into what we have as our approach. As I mentioned, the first thing that we understand is that you have to look at the organization as a system. Because in many occasions, what we've seen is that if the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing, the performance and the productivity definitely gets impacted. So one of the things that we start with is what is your strategic destination? Do you have a strategic plan? What is the utility that you're trying to create and where, how far along are you with that vision? Once we understand that scenario, that future strategic destination, that's when we start looking at, well, what's your organizational structure? Do you have the structure that can get you to that strategic destination? Do you have the processes, the tools, the technology in order to support the organization going there. And then obviously it's the people part. We have to look into, well, what, are the, what does staff look like? Do they have the skills, the capabilities? You probably have heard that in the utility industry, the workforce is aging. There's significant retirements. And well, how are you going to keep that know-how? And how are you going to make sure that those key positions are taken care of so that if somebody were to retire tomorrow, you don't lose all that and you're able to continue functioning? and obviously the financial aspects. So the cost requirements and the structure. Um, it's you know basically looking at the financial aspect. Do you have what it needs? How is the utility doing financially in order to succeed? One that frequently gets overlooked is the culture. And it, it's interesting because in the utility industry, my experience has been that that touchy-feely part is something that people tend to avoid looking at. But we definitely take a look at that because we have seen the best design plans fail in implementation because of the culture of the utility. 
So that's one aspect that we keep in, in mind and we have different ways of assessing an organization's culture. So that's the background. When we saw the RFP, and you can't see it well, but this is the visual. Sorry, was there a question? Or? Yeah. We, we might be able to turn up the lights or something to be able to see it a little better. So this is just the visual representation, the flow of what we're hoping to, what we have designed for you. And so one of the key aspects for the organizational study is the project management and communication. The way that it, it works is we establish the communication channel so that we're frequently touching base with the utility and also we knew that there was the reliability study. So that project management component is throughout the, the whole study to make sure that the communication is clear and that we're able to keep the pulse on the activities that we're doing. So that's one aspect. Then we get into the current situation analysis. That's where uh, we'll look at those different aspects that were highlighted <coughs> there. And I'll get into a little bit more detail on that on the, on the next slide. Then we do industry best practices and benchmarking. That information, all that analysis will lead us to be able to provide to you an organizational option. What do we think from an organizational standpoint the utility needs to look like? And that will be provided to you in a report and a presentation. But to detail more into the different tasks that we've defined. <coughs> so today we, we kicked off the project. What that looked like is really trying to further understand and, and, and determine where do we focus? What are those aspects that are key to Reading so that we can focus on those and to make sure that we provide to you solutions that will be able to help you move forward? And so we, we talked, uh, well, we will present to you the fee and the schedule and, and how we've defined that. But today was basically laying the foundation and the structure as to what we will look. Lidos will be back next week to continue with uh, meetings and interviews. We will start our interviews next week, uh, tomorrow. And then next week we will continue with interviews. That's the first level of assessment. It's trying to collect the data to get a clear picture of what the organization looks like. We then move into the second part which is the current situation analysis. To understand more in depth what uh, Reading looks like and what is currently happening within the utility, we started with, uh, well, we started with the interviews, but we also put together a request for information. And that data is being collected. We will review and uh, analyze the information provided so that we can get a clear picture, okay, what does your organizational structure look like? Again, based on the current situation, but on the future that you're trying to achieve, where's that <coughs> gap? Similar with the processes, similar with staffing and capabilities. We are frequently seeing in the utility industry that it's not just human resources anymore. It's a whole talent management approach, which gets into succession planning, which gets into career development. Do you, what do you need to have in place so that you have the skills and capabilities necessary to, to run the utility and get it into the future? And then the other aspect that we were asked to review was just the physical layout of the space. So we estimate that, you know, that usually takes around six weeks, um, but because of the holidays and uh, given that Thanksgiving is a few weeks away, we've added a week of that just to make sure that we have enough time to collect the data, analyze it, conduct the interviews, and provide back to you a current situation analysis report. We also will be doing industry best practices in comparison. <coughs> this gets to the performance of the utility and from reviewing information that uh, is available on your website, we know that you have some metrics in place. For instance, safety and safety are some of the ones that come to mind. So we take some of the information, some of the metrics that are currently in place and that the utility is monitoring and we also work with staff to identify key metrics that you would like for us to compare with other utilities. The comparison will also get into salaries, for instance, to make sure the, that's one of the things that we usually encounter, is are the salaries and the benefits in line with what's in the market? And um, so we'll do a comparison there as well. In doing the assessment or the current situation, we will identify best practices. What do we see that currently is in place in Reading? And maybe you're missing something. And so we will identify that and say, you know, compared to the industry, we notice X, Y, or Z. 
or it could be the other way around. It could be that we identify that currently you have a best practice in place in your top class, so we would obviously pinpoint that. As a result of the industry best practices uh, and benchmarking, you will also get a report. We today, uh, and it started the conversation about, well, if you wanted to compare yourself against other utilities, who would that be? And so we will identify the parameters to be compared on the list of utilities. And our market uh, research specialist defines and designs the survey instrument and, and carries that through, connecting and contact contacting other utilities. All the information gets boiled down to findings and recommendations, which are targeted and will be focused on the areas that we've mentioned. So we will look at the organizational structure. We will look at key business processes and making sure, as an example, sometimes we, we walk into a utility and immediately what we recognize that is that they're silos, that the different functional areas of the utility are not talking to each other. So what, what business processes are there in place to support that? or even within a functional area, what do you have in place um, and what could be done? And as I've addressed staffing, we'll get into do you have the adequate staffing to, and skills and capabilities to move you into the future and the best practices. All the other tasks get grouped into this final one to be able to provide to you a design of an organization. What we see the organization needs to look like from all these different aspects. And that is the scope of work. This is our schedule. It's been laid out considering that there's holidays, but we obviously are starting today. And we think that by February, we will be able to, develop, to deliver to you the final product, the final report with all the findings and recommendations. I was asked to provide to you the payment schedule. And this is how it was uh, proposed and defined in our proposal. So the project kickoff is this week and next week where we start doing the assessments and we will provide to you a summary of the meetings and the findings, initial findings from the project kickoff. The current situational analysis report, which we estimate by December will have complete. The best practices and the benchmarking. That one um, is, is a little iffy because of the holidays. Sometimes when it's holidays, around the holidays is not as easy. Staff from other utilities is not as readily available. So that's why we pushed it out a little bit more to January. By then, we will have comp compiled all the data that we need in order to provide the organizational options and we'll provide a draft report to you that looks, that presents the findings. This is what we're thinking. And then the final report and presentation will be uh, crafted once we receive the feedback and input from the utility. And then Obviously, I talked about project management. So this table illustrates the costs, the deliverables, and the payment schedule that have been defined so far. And I think that's it. So I guess this is the point where we can turn on the lights and see what questions you may have. Yeah, I had some questions, if I may. Please. Um, <coughs> so Patty, I'm assuming you'll be uh, looking at, um, you know, we're a municipal obviously, as opposed to investor-owned. Yes. Uh, but your database must have different comparisons of both of those, and scale is a, is a factor Focus in that, more, too. More, uh, yes, scale, and do you mean scale in terms of? Or just, just number of customers, revenue, yes. generation, et cetera. Yes. And, and the fact that we, are, you know, we don't generate. Yes, power, that's right? one of the key components. There's ratios that we have for the best practices of benchmarking that it's different if you're a generating uh, utility or if it's non-generation. So yes, we, we do have that and we consider that. The other aspect is that we have the industry standards, for instance, that we receive or we can get from uh, American Public Power. APPA has many publications, right. so there's that level. But then when we talk about, well, what are the utilities, we, we hope to make it more regional because it's different to have a utility here than to talk about Texas. So we do try to, to get that also. So I assume that some of your data is uh, not just from external sources, but from work you've previously mm -hmm. done with others. Mm -hmm. So you have an internal database. We do. We do have an internal database. Um, do you plan on interviewing the board? Us? No. No. That is a good question. It's not on the scope at the moment, but I think now that you bring it up, we're obviously, we have done that. 
um, in several instances to get that guidance and that insight as to how you see the utility and where you see the utility going. So. Everyone agreeable to that? Yes. 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 And, and what I didn't see on this, but I think you talked to it, was recommendations. I mean, are yes. you're going to be providing recommendations in terms of what needs to be changed and potential that's costs that might be associated with those? And that's the findings and recommendations. So throughout the, the different, at the organizational options part, definitely recommendations will, will be the initial draft of recommendations. And then the final report, you will have already looked at the draft and then we will be able to finalize. But obviously findings and recommendations. And then usually how it is, is findings the background. Why do we think this is important? And then the recommendation based on that. Great, thank Findings, you. background, and recommendation. And then um, Steve helped me clarify. Uh, the board, I would suggest interviewing the board members individually, but is there a preference? Is it, would you like it to be a collective interview uh, or individual? I think probably individual maybe would be that would interesting. Be my I, I, I'm open to either one. Individual. I could do it. I yep. do individual. I think that's individual? better. Each yeah. of us has their own thoughts. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sure. That would yeah. be my preference. No group think. We might be part of the. Well, I shouldn't say this. <laughs> we're part of the problem. <laughs> I'm sure, we are. We're not part of the problem. We are the problem. <laughs> <laughs> the solution. Right. Well, um, I've seen it go both ways. Yeah, that, that's not. I have a question related to uh, to, to that one. Um, in terms of strategic direction. I mean, there's a chicken and egg uh, question there in that my understanding is that the utility industry is under a significant pressures by distributed generation yes. um, and that local distributed generation is becoming a lot more economical. Therefore, when we're in the business of buying and selling, you know, we're going to be hurting over the, over, the, over the coming decades with new technologies coming in and the rising cost of transmission. So will you... Will you actually suggest whether we should go into generation? And if so, will you suggest whether we have the organizational capacity to actually, you know, build and operate uh, generation? As the utility industry is going, it all, ever since I started working in the utility industry, it's always going through unprecedented change. Right. That's the one word that I always keep hearing, and it's because it's, it's continuous. Change has never stopped. When we look at the organizational structure, one of the things, or the organizational assessment, we have to consider that these are the trends and the aspects that are impacting the industry. Now, there, in conversations that I've had today, there is a strategic plan that was defined in 2008, but I don't think that one captures where the utility is now. And so we will look at what the utility has in place as that strategic destination. If, let's say, distributed generation is totally not in the picture, that will be one thing that we'll recommend. You have to keep in mind that these trends are coming. So you're going to you're gonna work off this uh, six-year-old strategic? No, 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 no. That's where we start. And we've had the conversation. I think it highlighted four different aspects, which one of them, for instance, is customer service, if I remember correctly. So that's, that's one. Customer satisfaction and service tends to be something that utilities, municipal utilities and utilities in general focus on. So that's one aspect. But when we start getting into, well, where, how are you building this utility? And I think it touches upon the reliability study as well. What, what does this 20-year plan look like? If there's something that is missing from what our, we know is a, an industry practice or an industry trend, we will bring that to the table and let you know. Well, that's, that's a good general answer. But I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering about generation specifically and the economics of it and, and whether the organization is prepared to go into generation, and I, that's that's I mean, and I would I would assume since you've studied many other utilities, including Muni's, you might know of some who successfully did this after not having been in this business for 50 or 80 years, as which we haven't in what 90 years we haven't generated a watt of electricity, but we may now, I mean, which because it didn't ma didn't make yeah. sense economically, but that's changing. So I guess that's, and that's when you interview me, I'll say the same things, that this is what I'm mostly concerned about. And, and of course, we have to balance our, our uh, charter to be the low-cost provider with right. all the towns that surround us. And it's, you know, it's easy to do when NSTAR raises their rates by 37%, right? You can kind of duck under that umbrella pretty easily. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But um, if you have to follow them because of general market trends in terms of cost of electricity, then it may not be so easy. So there's some, I think, difficult 
issues to we're, we're trying to wrestle with, which you'll you'll see when you talk to us. Right. Not to get that yeah. We would like to be all things to all people at all times. And I know when you go through these exercises, there are a million questions that need to be answered. Uh, and we probably can't get to all of them. The issue of, uh, of whether this organization is preparing to go into target gener warning generation or distributed generation, we'll look at, but it's going to be up here at a, at a high level. Um, we need to have an integrated resource plan. We need to have strategic plans in order to really be able to whether your organization is ready uh, uh, to address those issues, but we're not going to do an IRP, we're not going to do a strategic plan for this. And, and defining, it's like whether you get into generation, that's a different analysis. Right. But you do have teams internally, I would imagine, that do help yeah. do exactly that? We do. Please. So uh, a couple of questions. So uh, on the benchmarking, I'm just sort of trying to visualize. So is it um, it's a combination of quantitative and qualitative uh, reporting? So on, let's say on the benchmark uh, with respect to uh, some metrics that you have in your database, is it kind of an industry average, best in class? Is it mm -hmm. cut that way and then shot an LD position along that? Yes. And, and so for instance, so we have the operating ratio. We have uh, labor productivity, retail customer per employee per circuit mile. Those are the type of benchmarks uh, that we try and we go out. And there's industry publications where we can get that. Sometimes it's out of their uh, just uh, annual reports and budgets that we're able to find. And other times we, we request assistance from the utility so that we can get the connection in whatever utilities you're trying to benchmark against so that we can uh, you know, have that conversation and get the data. How we, so then if I could add the incentive. If I was another utility, why would I go through all the work? And so what we do is the way the benchmarking is set up, we contact the utilities and we tell them that they will get a copy of the report, but it's much more high level. And it's always confidential. So the utilities are <coughs> quoted utility A, utility B, utility C. We tell Reading, who, which of the utilities you are, and then there will be like the uh, industry average, or and and the other utilities we tell them, you know, these are the ones that participated, but they don't know who, what, like if we're talking about a bar graph, which bar provi it represents which utility. So it is displayed on like a bar graph. It's a, yeah, it's it's mostly a PowerPoint presentation where you get the graphics and you're able to in a visual way see what all the results for the utilities are usually there's a bar that or a line that shows the industry average and then there's some commentary from us but it sounds like you actually go out and do real-time benchmarking as opposed to draw into your database is that right we do we do that and it depends on what we're going to benchmark what are the parameters that are of interest to reading and so if we have it pretty significant in our database then we always tend to go back into our database. One of the things that impacts uh, that availability of data is also the region. If the, for, for the Northeast, do we have what you need? And if not, we, we do have to go back and, and call and get those contacts. And what's, having you've done some groundwork, so if we uh, look at RMLD and what you know about it, what's the universe of uh, utilities likely to be numbers-wise? Is it 15 or 50 or just trying to get a sense of for the benchmarking, yeah. we tend to go from six to eight utilities that we compare against because of the level of effort in designing the survey, sending it to them, and getting the information back. But on top of that, is it likely, uh, I'm assuming you have a database with a much, well, how many do you have in your, in your oh. company database? Yeah, I... Our experience is that try to narrow it down to six to eight utilities and give you more insight about how your performance compares so that we can you know, we can help you really understand what's 
similar between you and the six utilities, what's different about you and the six utilities, and how does the information know that comparison to the managers you use to understand where they stand? As you put benchmarking to work as a management tool over time, and you begin to track key performance indicators within the benchmark in broader sampling and be more guided, we would have recommended that at this outset, but that's not how we would like to do it. Yeah, it just, uh, it just strikes me as being kind of a small universe of uh, mm -hmm. uh, companies to look at. You, but you do get a you do get the benefit of a larger sampling out of the American Public Power Association for the season because they do include it in the benchmark. Yep. So you do get a sense of a broader sampling. Yep. And the, the six or eight though are pretty well matched to our MLD. So I mean we will pick them together. Yeah we don't we'll pick them together yeah. and see that. I mean that's the idea it's a smaller quantity but they're and they yeah. don't generate, and they have some of the, maybe facing some similar issues. Yeah. And, and then what, kind of looking at the, uh, the end, uh, just curious of how you work with clients. So at the recommendations and findings stage, is it often that, uh, are you, uh, I don't remember from earlier presentations, but are you primarily strategic consultants or do you do a lot of implementation? So when you have the report, is it a handoff to Colleen and the team to say, well, here's, is what we recommend and go implement, or is it likely that you engage with clients and how does that work? I love the implementation part and I'll tell you why. It has been my experience that we can put together a really good plan and work with the utility, but the utility has a full-time job. And so when we're brought in to support with implementation, we define the process so that implementation happens. Uh, it's been my experience to make implementation happen. There's a core group that is, a, you know, we put together a core planning team, to put it that way. And, and we work together to say, okay, these are the recommendations. How do we move forward with that? And so there's a, a strategy that's defined to make sure that implementation happens. So for the majority, I will admit, we usually are invited to tell us what's wrong, give us their findings and recommendations. Frequently, we're told, well, we'll handle implementation. And, and it's less of the time when the utility invites us back to make sure that we get it implemented, but it does happen. And I would just to make sure you understand where we come from, we are um, utility engineers, utility financial experts, uh, utility generation experts, we have management consulting capabilities. We're not management consultants that just have you know, some knowledge in the business. Uh, our subject I liked your, your, your thoughts about the physical space. I know um, our general manager has commented that we're far flung in it, and that's, I know from my own office where I work, it's, it's kind of an issue, physical layout and how teams work or don't interact. So that's really interesting that you're gonna include that. So. We were talking about that. It's been my experience that the organizational structure, but also the physical structure determines behavior. Yeah. And so many times it's like, well, I, if my team, whoever I'm working with is, too far away, just it starts impacting communications. And nowadays we have a lot of virtual, so email and chats and all that, but it does impact. So we will be taking a look at that. Maybe we can move town hall into the RMLD headquarters. <laughs> just an idea. <laughs> uh, I guess just to follow up on my comment, uh, so will you, do, uh, will you do implement, do you, uh, do you ever experiment with game sharing concepts? Or so, so from a, a company or utilities point of view, they may be interested in getting help implementing because it's always hard to run the railroad and then still lay new tracks. So, uh, but co companies sometimes want more of a guarantee that if we bring in the experts that we will get some defined return on investment. So it's kind of like a game sharing concept. Do, do you do that or uh, what, what, what confidence <coughs> can you give the uh, utility if you decide to implement that they will in fact realize some level of uh, improvement or, or You know, I haven't done the gain sharing, have you? No, I mean, it just doesn't happen in our industry. I've been in 30 years and, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the idea of public power partnerships, of public private partnerships work in some model. Uh, I've certainly never seen it applied in the context of organizational improvement. And, and the, the challenge is, is that, you know, um, we, uh, if, if we were 
intimately throughout implementation we did, and this was an engagement that went over a period of time and we had you know, some influence, you could reasonably expect that we should be closely associated with many developers, but we're not. We analyze, we take our experience based on working with the people and working with other utilities, and we provide really good actionable recommendations to the developers, your management team, your technical team, if you want, and then they are responsible for implementing it. We're certainly happy to help, but we're just not in control of it enough to even entertain the idea of somehow trying to share in your, in your results. The best uh, motivator that we have to be effective for you is we don't want to do this project and then leave. We'd like to have a relationship with you. We'd like to become your trusted advisor, and we'd like to be involved and engaged during the implementation. That's our intent, and to do a good job banking our reputation and, and having you think of us first that's very, very strong usually for, for us. So just one last comment. So I assume, Carmen, do we have access to the presentation? Can, and particularly, I don't know if you've received it or someone did on there, Lisa, so we will in terms of the implementation schedule and the fees. Or there is no, oh, I can put it back. Yeah. The, there is no implementation schedule. Oh. This is just the, and I know it's so small, but it's, yeah. it highlights what the different tasks are, project kickoff, current situational analysis, industry best practices, defining the organizational options, and then presenting to you the findings and recommendations. Right. So there is no implementation there. And then the, that is the uh, table that illustrates the cost for each task. Yeah, I, I shouldn't have said implement, when I said implementation, I meant more of the Oh, to, to conduct schedule. a study. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's oh. tiny. Oh. Copy the slides. Okay. Copy the slides. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, anything else? <coughs> I'm going to switch to Ken, but it's on my computer, so. <coughs> oh, good. Um, do you have a VGA port on there or just HDMI? I do. Are you, do you have a Dell? Do you need ports? Good, we're good. I'll get that later. Thank you. And I love it cold though. <laughs> Can it be cold enough for me? It's New England all my life, so. First, my name is Ken McNeil. I'm a booth and associates. I want to apologize for my voice. I have developed a little bit of laryngitis over the past couple of days. So. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Yes, I'm with Booth and Associates, and we're, we're charged in doing the uh, electrical system reliability report. Uh, just a quick background, uh, we have been in business since 1960. Uh, <coughs> the majority of our client base are um, rural electric cooperatives and municipal electric systems. We have a lot of experience working with and familiarity with the uh, municipal uh, light departments. Um, Again, we're licensed in 34 states and Massachusetts being included in that. On our project approach for uh, the reliability study, one of the most important functions is going to be the uh, completing the condition assessment. And we have divided the uh, 
system analysis into four components, uh, one being substation, the distribution transmission system, system planning, and strategic and financial services. Um, each member of the team uh, has in excess of 20 years of experience in the utility industry. So we did target these um, condition assessments uh, to have experts in the field on site here. Uh, our substation group will be coming up. Uh, we have one gentleman coming up for an entire week. Um, and then our transmission distribution, we plan on having two uh, distribution engineers up for a, a week's duration also. Uh, this week I, I have been up uh, for the past couple of days uh, gathering data and speaking with staff. And uh, Terry Berge from Strategic Financial Services uh, has a uh, long history that from the financial aspect of the, uh, the system analysis, he will be conducting uh, that end of things. Again, with this uh, condition assessment, we'll be compiling a lot of system data, system operations, uh, interviewing management and staff, uh, discussing how, getting a, a real familiarity of how the system is being operated right now so that we can go back and part of, uh, as I go through the scope of services, part of it um, is gaining where you are now and benchmarking that against industry standards that are outlined in uh, your varying, various governing, governing agencies. We'll be reviewing, uh, reviewing maintenance programs, um, <coughs> comparing those to um, the maintenance schedules that are outlined in IEEE standards, ANSI standards. Um, one important thing, our substation gentleman, when he's up, will be going into each substation uh, downloading all the relay settings so that we can get, go back to the office and compare the coordination to make sure that the uh, equipment and your personnel are protected inside the station in case of a fault. We'll be evaluating system losses. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, uh, the technical and operations organization, uh, this will be an overlap with the LATOS in that uh, we will review from the engineering perspective, uh, the uh, adequacy of staff, the qualifications that are required to implement some of the recommendations and, uh, and make sure that information is transferred over to LATOS to be included in their organizational study also. We will be evaluating the uh, reliability indices over the past five years to see how they compare to uh, utilities in the area, utilities of the same size. Um, and in that is part of our analysis of the system. Any project system upgrades that would, uh, that would be prominent as far as improving reliability or maintaining current levels of reliability. One important um, process will be to review your safety practices and programs and that will as our substation uh, group are, are up on site we'll be talking about your particular safety programs and practices as they uh, as they relate to your substations also uh, the TND group will review the same programs and practices as they relate to your um, transmission distribution system and again they will be benchmarked against current standards, uh, the National Electric Safety Code, which uh, basically governs uh, utility operations, will make sure that you're in compliance with uh, all those governing agencies and bodies. Uh, we'll also be looking at the system reliability, flexibility, so that in, um, in the event of a system outage, you will have adequate capacity to backfeed on the system. Uh, we'll, as part of this initial study, we'll be uh, creating an electric system model um, so that we will be able to go in and get a, uh, a good calculation of uh, current fault current levels, voltage levels on the system. It would also allow us to do um, interconnection of circuits to test the back cap capacity back feeds. Any deficiencies we find in those areas will be part of our recommendations and plans uh, to upgrade the system. We'll also be evaluating engineering and planning functions. Uh, 
as they relate to uh, <laughs> electric system modeling, the current uh, uh, GIS status and functionality, and how those different um, organisms relate together and how they interact. Uh, uh, one good example of that in my discussions in the past couple of days, you know, I found that there was a lack of an arc hazard assessment study. And based on National Electric Safety Code, essentially mandated that those studies be in place by uh, January 1, 2009. So you know, there, there is a compliance issue there, but to create a valid arc flash assessment, we have to have available fault currents at all points on the system. To get those calculated, you need an updated system model. Well, to get a good system model rolls back to your GIS system as having an, a complete, accurate uh, GIS system that can be uploaded into that model. So you can see how all these elements are related and you know, finding a lack of the arc flash study relates back to having these models and um, the GIS system fully functional and, and operating. So again, it, it seems that uh, just based on initial analysis, and again, I've only been here for about a day and a half, so, but that initial analysis, the uh, GIS system will be an important cog in the operations of the system. And, uh, and as far as our report, we will be making an, uh, an evaluation of that GIS system and then also with interviews with, uh, with staff and management um, to, gain, to gain an understanding of what uh, elements you want out of the GIS system. So when we go out and start collecting data or whoever goes out to uh, collect data, uh, that all of those elements are collected at one time to get your fully functional GIS that, I mean, that could it relates to your model, it can relate to an outage management system, even relates back to pole attachment agreements if you collect that. Uh, you can all go, also go back to a transformer loading management system which would give you all kinds of information about age and condition of facilities that can be utilized in generating reports, generating work orders to be proactive in replacement of, of aged and uh, deteriorating equipment. Uh, in, in all of this, all this evaluation, we'll be looking at system design. Again, benchmarking that against standard utility practice, most of which is outlined in IEEE standards, in ANSI standards, in um, National Electric Safety Code requirements. So we'll be benchmarking against essentially industry standard requirements that are out there and make and take great pains to make sure that you are, remain in compliance with those because in the long run, it's a reliability issue, it's a safety issue for your employees and a safety issue for the general public. So that is the overriding concern when we go in and start looking at these elements. Again, we'll get to the schedule in a, in a couple of <coughs> slides, but one element that we did talk about as our substation, uh, we expect our substation guys and our distribution transmission guys to be up sometime within the next two to three weeks to do their assessments. And uh, as project manager, I've instructed them, if in the event we are out in the field looking at the facilities and we come across any uh, safety measure, any code violation, safety issue, that those will be brought immediately to the attention of the engineering group that they can be addressed at that point rather than wait until the end of the process, which is scheduled to end sometime in March. So uh, if we see any overriding safety issues or code violations, they will be brought immediately to the attention of the, of the group. Uh, as part of the defined scope that was outlined in the uh, request for proposals, we'll all be also be looking at the uh, your existing fiber loop, um, its added adequacy for existing communications, its adequacy for expanded communications, and um, as part of the RFP, it also asks us to look at any additional um, features that we could take advantage of, either an expansion of the loop or 
any other opportunities that are out there to take advantage of that. So those, those will be examined and, uh, and included in our study. Um, we're also asked to look at the historical uh, infrastructure investments over the past few years and determine, again, benchmarking against other utilities of this size, looking at your total plan investment that is out in the field to ensure that your, that your levels of historical investment have been adequate for systems of this size. Our final report will specifically address each item that, that's been outlined in the scope uh, and we will provide a set of recommendations either for programs to be instituted, maintenance programs to be instituted, or specific projects if we see uh, in the course of our modeling um, any deficiencies in the system both under normal uh, normal feed circumstances as well as an N minus one contingency circumstance with N minus one being loss of any one large major piece of equipment. Um, as part of that we will establish a priority, uh, establish a timeline because some of these programs may be implemented over a five-year window, ten-year window, even up to a 15, 20-year window. So we'll establish priority of projects, project timelines, and, and try to put together a, a <coughs> relative estimate of the cost of implementation of that program. Our schedule, we intend to uh, complete the condition assessment um, sometime around mid-December. Again, the guys are hopefully uh, going to be getting up here before Thanksgiving if they can work out <coughs> scheduling with, with the staff because we will require escorts into the substations and also possibly escorts around the uh, distribution system. Um, of course, we will complete our system analysis and uh, based on the original RFP, we adjusted our dates uh, to match the same timeline that was in the original RFP. So we look to deliver a draft report mid-February with the final report delivered in mid-March. On our payment schedule, unfortunately I do not have that slide on, on my computer, but we have three particular <laughs> payment benchmarks, uh, which would be, uh, the first would be after the completion of the condition assessment, because having, having our folks up here, uh, that many folks for um, that duration of time, represents about 40% of the cost of the budget, which is around, uh, that particular task is around $64,500. Uh, putting together the uh, draft report as we have their, all their findings will be funneled back through my group to, uh, to take their recommendations and compile those into a cohesive report. And that will be done again and delivered on uh, sometime mid-February that will be our second benchmark, which will make up another 40% of the project, so another 60, uh, 64, 5. And then the final report to be delivered will be our final benchmark and the final 20% of the <coughs> project, which would also serve as a retainer until we deliver a, uh, a final report that is signed off on by staff. Are there any questions? Um, I had one, one question. <coughs> the system model sounds great. Um, is it something that gets left behind that someone can actually use here and get trained on? Or is it something that you do and use and it, but basically it's proprietary to you? Well, the uh, staff here has, has Windmill, Millsoft's Windmill Distribution Analysis Software. Uh, our firm, 99% of our clients use Windmill. I basically started on it my first day at Booth in February 1988. They stuck me in a room with a windmill manual that was DOS based. So that's how far we go back using windmill. Okay. And I, I do have a gentleman at my office that's been working with me for 15 years. He uses windmill every day. But this, this first pass through just to get an initial analysis, we're going to have to create that kind of the old school way. Sure. Uh, we've been working <coughs> with Hamid's staff to get the basic information we need to get a uh, I don't want to call it a rudimentary model, but just a baseline model we can, uh, that we can analyze each line section, each circuit uh, with that circuit loading. And again, our first recommendations are likely going to be to 
get the GIS system updated. That way you can get all the sure. detail in down to the transformers on each phase. And then once that is established, have that uploaded in, you can upload those directly into Windmill to get a real time model. And at that point, you know, we'll make recommendations about training of staff to make sure that. Uh, so that we can use it subsequent. That you would have that on site as long as you keep your GIS. And GIS is going to be the central focus, likely, of all this. As long as that's kept updated, you will always have that ability to roll that GIS system right into your windmill, to a brand new windmill model. And you will have that to. Uh, Great. Thank you. To use it as long as you need it. Uh, on that same point, uh, how. Up to how thorough is our GIS right now? How complete is it? Would you say at this point, like just, I say, we've I only just got here, but we've only had it. Uh, that's not my specialty. I manage the system planning. Um, we did prepare a data request several weeks ago, and uh, as part of that data request, we requested the uh, GIS shape files that you have right now, and the distribution guys have already uploaded that and are going through that right now. So when they come up. They will have an idea of exactly where it stands at this point and uh, be able to make some type of recommendations after they discuss it with, with your staff on whether to recommend uh, an update to the existing system or whether it would be just start back, get all your data fields that you want to collect and go out and do a wholesale collection of data so that you have 100% confidence in the data that is my understanding is there's not that 100% confidence level in the data that's in the existing GIS at this point. And uh, it'll just be a determination whether uh, that can be effectively updated to get you to that 100% confidence level or whether it'd be better just to start at point one and gather all the fields of data you want to collect while you're out there. Because my understanding is, you know, you, you may not have collected uh, pole attachments. Um, so, I mean, that's always been a big issue as far as pole rentals, pole attachments, pole ownership, as I've learned in the past few days, is, is I don't want to say an issue, but it is a concern that mm -hmm. there is a mixed ownership of poles in the area. So, a lot of that data can be generated, calculated, down to the age of the transformers, the age of the poles. You can do queries on uh, you know, every pole that's over 60 years old. So you can go out and test those, see if they're in need for replacement or pose a safety issue, that type of thing. So at a high level, this sort of data has not been collected and double checked at the department in the past. Is that a fair statement? I mean, um, it's a fair statement? So we have, a, we have some, historically the organization has not been run in a way that we had good data on our system, our assets, it's age of the assets, that things are accurate and the information is there when people need it. That's, we don't have that now. That at a high level, that's the situation we have right now. Right. So there's a lot of work to do and um, it's just interesting that this, this doesn't exist before. That, we, that this will, has not been done. find that yeah. the, uh, this GIS system as we start putting the plan together as far as implementation around various elements of the company, you will find that it, the GIS system can touch, will touch engineering. Right. It'll likely touch your financials because if you've got a good record of your it. facilities with age and depreciation to get plant value, accurate plant values of right. your system, um, maintenance schedules. Those totally get why it's important. I'm just trying to get a sense of how bad is it now. and uh, and the. I mean, it'd be interesting as you go forward, we'd love to hear from you about, maybe it isn't that bad, but it sounds like we have a, it is bad right now, and it's been, it's been derelict for a number of years, if not decades, here. But they've, they've worked on information leakage in the GIS system. Right. The transformers, the formation, the staging, the size of the wires, which basically they need for model the system, uh, as well as the age of the equipment, some, and uh, plus the attachment, what's going up. I mean, it's so, it's so obvious that this is foundational to what this department is supposed to be doing and how, how we can run better and save money and avoid problems. 
So I can just say for myself that I'm happy that we have some professional eyes on this problem from a number of directions at this moment and that it's going to be going forward. We're going to have a really locked down understanding of our system. So very glad that, that this is underway. Well, again, I don't want to make rash statements as, as I've well, only been here for two days. But I know, again, but I think that's one of those things that yeah. will be the crux. And I think it's going to be very important to have meetings in, internally, again, to see what areas that, what data could be effective for different areas of the company so that when, say it is an initial data collection from the start, that when whoever is out in the field collecting this data has every piece of information, every field, every attribute, at every attribute that you want to fill is collected at that time. Right for now, efficiency purposes. Now, I have, I have no, listen, on another topic, I, I don't have any big expectations in this next area. It's a bit of a hobby horse of mine, but um, my, hope, my hope is that in the next several years, we can start to look at the fiber question uh, and, and a, a possible revenue monetization opportunities done in a careful way. And, and I know this is a little bit, a little bit to the side of what your main focus is. You did mention it. It, does Booth have experience in actual business models in this area, or at least saying, here's your capacity and here's what other munis have done? Uh, uh, we have a, an extensive amount of experience installing fiber and designing fiber loops right. in the state of Maryland. Uh, we do, in our financial services group, that's one thing that they will bring to the table is any opportunities that they're aware of, any programs because uh, we do have clients that do have fiber loops, and uh, he can bring that to the table, some of the options that they have explored. But what are you things. talking about when you say options? Or, I um, mean, are you, are you talking about data services, yeah, like going expanding. outside of the electric business and doing a different business? Right. They have some experience in those areas. They, right. we can pro In our report, we'll say, this may be an area you want to explore. This may be an area you want to stay away from right. because in our experience, they have never either panned out or worked at that Well, it point. depends. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, there's, some, there's a number in Massachusetts that have worked, and it's all a question of doing it in a very targeted, careful way and not, not doing but anything again, rash. Again, it will be, it'll be yeah. more of a 10,000-foot yeah. look. Yeah. But the primary focus is going to be having the adequate capacity to, uh, to bring back the data. The I mean, I think the data piece, forget about monetization, the data piece is only going to be more important, and I know Colleen has mentioned this in the past, regardless of any notions of going into the data business, is that houses could be, you know, could have intelligent meters on every house, and down the road <coughs> that you have a fine-grained demand response that goes maybe even beyond what we're envisioning today, you know, down decades in the future, and it would be good to know that we have enough capacity to handle any, any type of scenario for grid management down the road. And part of our charge has been to put together essentially a road map, a long range load map, uh, road map that goes out 20 years in five year increments. So, you know, down the road we may have some of those things um, in the plan for future considerations. Right. And, you know, some of these programs will be long term implementation. I mean, you got people buying these Nest thermostats now uh, under the under the Christmas tree, uh, you know, for their families, and that they didn't have internet controlled stuff before. But now, you know, hundreds or thousands of customers may have these kinds of gadgets that they're buying themselves, and it's just something that we ought to be aware. Maybe your your fresh college grad uh, understands this better than I do, but I mean, it is the future to have this kind of data driven and optimization, and it would be great to know that we have the ability to do that. Got a uh, question? So I, I think certainly the board appreciates the work that's going to be done in both groups. Mm -hmm. I, I just had a kind of a implementation uh, logistics question. So these kinds of initiatives typically can be a little invasive because you have interviews and you need staff to go in and out of the organization with you. Uh, it sounds like both groups are doing some sharing of information, which is helpful to that end, but. I'm just wondering uh, what expectations might be in, in the next several months around, you know, the, the how invasive it will be in terms of, you know, the day-to-day -day operation of, of RNLD. It's obviously something that has to happen, but because we're doing two of these studies, you know, in parallel, this makes, you know, sort of a multiplicative effect. So I know it's probably not easy no. to assess, but it's more just a question around 
should we expect that you know we're going to be uh, uh, having some productivity issues uh, from the IDA level just because you know if everybody's being interviewed and everyone's being escorted around the substations, you know, it's fewer resources to, to run the railroad. Well, too, that's that's why we want to try to be as less invasive as possible. That uh, you know we've got contact points for escorts for, from the substation group and for the distribution group. They're they're charged to schedule their with their contact point the time that they yeah. they would be coming up. Trying not to be uh, you know again with substation we will have to have escort for oh, entry into the stations. For the distribution, as long as we've got maps that are relatively uh, geographic in nature, yeah. I don't anticipate those guys needing escorts full time for the whole week they're up here. But David Huffstetler, who's the head of the T&D group, I would expect you know, he would have some questions and, uh, and, and spend at least a day, day and a half in-house. Uh, Talking sure, with the GIS yeah, group. It's a necessary part of the process. I think. And how about from Lido's point of view? Uh? We, I'm thinking about it just the same way. We have a range of ideas of what we want for innovation, and they're mostly stuff that we want to come out of the <laughs> Then, touch points for faster parts for our community transportation. That's not what I think the impact, or rather, what I drive there is whenever there's an organization like touch points, it tends to I only, again, I, we fully support it, uh, it, again, because we're doing two of them, it adds to the complexity. Mm -hmm. It's also, you know, November, December, and, you know, there's some few people take vacation time. And so I would say to the extent that you all are flexible with your expectations in terms of scheduling, uh, we can be too. If you've got priorities of getting away, well, restoration, bad weather, and it's better for us to stay away and the schedule has to slide, that's the reality of the world that we're in. And you're flexible in that regard, we're flexible in that regard. Otherwise, our goal is to get traffic in and get out, minimize the duration of disruption. I'm sure Colin will provide guidance on that. Good, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We look forward to uh, seeing the thank you very guys. Much. Yeah. yeah, excellent. Yeah. Okay, and we now have um, report of the committees, and Phil and John will provide some updates. First, uh, Vice Chair Pacino on the Charter Review. Okay, the Charter Review Committee is pretty much winding down at this point. Um, there have been some changes. Um, one of the things that unfortunately happened is that the wrong uh, thing got up on the website. It has been corrected. I don't know if it's been corrected, but the changes that we that you've seen in the past basically deleted the paragraph that basically was covered by state law and the paragraph and the, in the paragraph that de, that we define calling the manager's uh, terms and of, of employment. Those are the only changes that have been made at this point. Uh, there are other changes that legal count the RMLD legal counsel uh, suggested uh, we have a contrary opinion from the town of Reading legal counsel which I have shared with Dave and Colleen and apparently I, I've asked that it be reviewed by the RMLD council I don't know what the status of that is um, at this point um, one of the things that maybe we need to do is at some point you know I know we maybe we're going to talk on later on about maybe the selectmen in this and this group meeting and maybe this should be one of the discussions in order to see if there's some sort of uh, some sort of middle ground between the two between the two legal counsels on this because there's some conflict between the two legal counsels as to what can be done and what can't be done at this point mm -hmm. so well i think a joint meeting would be a great idea yeah on any number of topics um, so right so uh, phil as it stands now uh, do we, we we have so it's being reviewed by councils, but <coughs> do we have a uh, 
uh, an up-to-date, here's what we believe to be the, the changes, but are there more changes contemplated? There, at this point in time, there are no more changes right. contemplated to the uh, anything that affects the RMLB at this point from a meeting that took place this past Monday. Okay. And our, our timetable is such that this is uh, looking to go to a town meeting in January. And so we're not meeting this coming week because of the, the town, the Reading Town meeting. The next meeting is scheduled really for the uh, 24th of November, at which point that we're going to try to write the background material and decide who's going to say what at, at town meeting in, so in some of those areas, and then uh, probably have a, a cleanup in uh, a couple of meetings in, uh, in December at that point. Can you circulate for us, please? Because I know there has been some different versions. I just want yep. to make sure we... Right, yeah, yeah. we want to happy to, yeah. um, I, I don't know if it's the corrected version. What happened is, quite truthfully, is that the changes were made when Laura Jemmy was um, overseeing the committee and Bob Lellashur got the wrong information from Laura, is what, is, is from, my, from what my understanding of what happened is on that, so. But each of the respective councils are looking at the same piece of information. Well, right? that's, that's the question. I mean, I shared our legal opinion with, with uh, the Town of Reading Legal Council, and they came up with a, a different interpretation, which I've asked, which I've passed along to the department. The department has passed it along to the legal council at this point. And we'll have to see where we go at this point. But again, it would be very helpful if we had a meeting, you know, between this committee <coughs> and the selectmen to work out some of the some of the the disconnects that have kind of gone on recently. Mm -hmm. Is there a next step to that? Do we need to? I'll send a, uh, we have, Parsi West, do you want to, how should we go forward? Maybe we could have a joint meeting, the RMLB and the Board of Selectmen. Is that? I was just going to say you work through uh, Bob. Bob. Yeah, yeah, okay, fine. Does that sound like a good idea to you? Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything you wanted to say on that matter since you're here? I mean, you're sitting through this meeting. We'd love to hear from you or get your input. Okay. Right. Well, thanks for coming. I think it's been a few months since we've had uh, any select people in the room. I, I may be wrong, but so it's right. No, no, it's fine. I mean, we're all we're all busy, so I think uh, more communication is better than less. So thank you for coming. Um, so yeah, I'll I'll email Bob, and we'll see if we can set that up. Um, and and that was also something Colleen had. Suggesting to us would be a good idea. So, um, anything to add on this? No. Nope. No. That's no. it. Yes. No. No. Okay. Um, and then we have an update from uh, Commissioner Stempek on the General Manager Review Committee, subcommittee. We met shortly before this meeting. Yes, we met uh, a little bit earlier before this meeting, and the intent of the meeting was to uh, review the criteria which we have historically. I say historically, at least going back a few years, uh, evaluated the performance of the general manager of the RMLD. And <coughs> some of the material or the, the criteria was either out of date, uh, inappropriate, or needed to be changed. So what we have uh, done within the committee is make recommendations uh, to the full committee, uh, to, excuse me, to the full board, um, at which we will uh, incorporate into the new document. And the recommendation uh, is that we, uh, once we receive that, that each one of the commissioners then fill it out, evaluate it, and at our next meeting we will um, uh, tally the results and make a recommendation uh, relative to the uh, uh, the general manager uh, compensation. Um, we are a bit out of date with that. I've mentioned that before, that this should have been done in July 15th for contractual issues. Uh, so we're uh, pretty far down the road, so anything that we would do would be um, basically um, ret retroactive back to the contract date. Uh, I might mention that uh, we did uh, look at a number of things that were accomplished in the year, year and uh, a quarter or so, um, so far, and uh, when you begin adding up the cost savings that were associated with uh, many of the things were addressed, cost savings both for this year and over the next couple of years. It tends to add up to approximately in the $300,000 plus dollar category, uh, which is uh, quite interesting in terms of the level of change that needed to be incurred, that needed to happen 
um, and a significant amount of that being just even on the legal front. Um, and so uh, I think it's, uh, it's just reflective of the uh, job that has been performed uh, so far. So in any event, um, our recommendation is that uh, uh, we incorporate the changes. Uh, we come to the next meeting uh, and we use that as a basis for then um, making a recommendation for compensation. Thank you. Um, just to add to that, there's a lot of, just from having worked closely with Colleen and the board, I know Colleen to be very focused on a lot of very important granular things. Uh, as this study showed tonight, where we learned that so much of the basic data collection and maintenance for that's important to the grid, you know, really hasn't hasn't been done up to snuff. And that's the kind of person uh, that Colleen is. She's an engineer, and she, you know, bolts things down. Um, I could never do that, and um, I think we're we're lucky to have her. Um, and you know all that stuff is really appreciated and it's it's hard to put into a simple soundbite a lot of this stuff that she's been doing although I think if 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 you don't mind I know there's been a few things I know one one thing when I first started was you know we come in on Saturdays and we sign off on on the bills the the week's ex expenses and I was noticing you know seven hundred dollars an hour for for legal counsel mm -hmm. and these are the kinds of things like what and it's one of those things that I know we've we've changed, and we don't do that anymore. And it's a lot of things at that level. And, and Colleen, if you don't mind, I know there's a few things you preliminarily put down that you've saved the department and the ratepayers. And if you, I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you want to just mention a couple of them now. Sure. Um, yeah, we did. Uh, we looked at the the legal fees, and um, you know that uh, going to other legal counsel that had just as many credentials and. At, uh, really less than half the cost. And in addition to that, um, we created working groups within all of the unions. Uh, mm -hmm. These working groups help to um, prevent grievances. When I got here, we had over eight grievances and four union arbitrations. Uh, those alone would probably save about $80,000 in legal bills um, and then probably another 90 in, in eliminating the grievances. Every single grievance was eliminated. Uh, every single arbitration was eliminated with no further costs. All through these working groups of sitting down and talking things out. Um, we, uh, the career development plans, um, I created those myself. They've actually been used um, in a number of uh, NEPA and APPA. And so by creating them, we probably saved about $60,000 by doing that in-house. Restructuring the line operations to two-man crews and developing an apprentice program probably saved about thirty to 50000 um, Every single request for proposal that a lot of utilities will send out because they don't have the in-house talent for someone to write RFPs probably save about anywhere between fifty and 100000 each RFP that's written. Mm -hmm. So we, wrote, we write most of the RFPs in-house and since Hamid come on board, you know, we've written the tree trimming, we wrote the organizational study of the reliability study. Um, uh, there's probably seven or eight RFPs that have been done over the last year. Um, obviously, we, we have uh, drug and alcohol now, and, and almost 90% of our employees, including management. Um, I think you probably mean testing. We testing. have drug and alcohol yeah, testing. Drug <laughs> testing <laughs> which, yeah. Which, yeah, we haven't seen any of it. <laughs> Which that was, that's going to be a slight increase in cost only because we have to pay for a testing company. But I think in, in safety yeah, aspects, that's, um, that's yeah. probably priceless that of what right. we would gain out of Back that. Back up on this one for a minute. Yeah. Tell us what, ha what we had before. Did we have situations where what people did not have mandatory drug and alcohol? What, what categories? Before, um, we had CDL drug and alcohol testing, which is mandated by the Department of Transportation. Right. Mm -hmm. But typically in a utility, there's a lot more other employees that have safety-sensitive jobs that don't drive CDL-sized trucks. Sorry, what's CDL for the? Uh, for like bucket trucks yeah, okay. uh, that have a so gross vehicle weight over a certain amount of pounds, 36,000 pounds or 20,000 okay. pounds. So pri let me just get let me make sure I understand. Prior to this, there were people who were, and, and it's not, not, nothing against any employee, but, but right. just they were not required to be subject to mandatory drug and alcohol tests, Correct. but could drive heavy equipment and, and climb poles and things like that. Uh, no, the ones not climb that, poles. that drive the heavy trucks are mandated to have the drug and alcohol okay. testing. It was 
every other employee. I see, right, right. Um, you that know, didn't. your technicians, your engineers that are also subjected to high voltage and safety sensitive equipment that are not subjected to random drug testing and alcohol. And now? And now we have a majority of people that are in. We have one small little group that's left. And that, again, was also done under the working group um, discussions. Mm -hmm. And then. Um, I mean, as a, as a member of the board, I'd like to, I'd like to thank you and, and also thank the employees for, for making those changes. You know, is this really important? And again, it goes back to the granular ma good management practice that we, that we have so that these changes have been made. And it's, it's better for everybody involved. And it's just, it's to your credit, it's to the employee's credit. And just a, a thank you from the board yeah. you know, to all of you yeah. well, for those kinds of things. It helps me sleep better at night because when I, I mean, first came and it wasn't implemented, which is typical for utility, it, it concerned me, right. so it was a priority. But um, mm. just a couple more system integration roadmap linking the GIS with the outage management so that we develop the roadmap. Um, Ken will be doing another roadmap so that we can compare where Hamid and I are looking at things so that we have a, a nice independent review on that. It was probably about $50,000. Uh, master site facilities plan and RFP development, um, probably about 5000 on that one, it's it's just the, the preliminary one. Um, creating the new technical services group. Since we didn't have any maintenance here, we developed a preventative maintenance program. We'd probably pay a couple hundred thousand dollars to do that. Hamid and I put together that program and then we developed the team of e existing employees and developed a journeyman program. They're now in training so that each of the substations will have the appropriate testing and maintenance done in a three-year cycle as planned, which is typical for, for utility. Um, a lot of these things that, you know, we know to do. I mean, Hamid and I have done organizational reliability studies in the past. The point of having the consultant is that we have roadmaps and what needs to be done, and then you get that independent review. But there were certain things that, from a safety <coughs> aspect or from a core business, like maintenance, that we had to put into place immediately. Um, that was a lot of culture changes, and, and with these working groups, right. we were able to get through it. Um, was, was Commissioner Stempeck's estimate of $300,000 in financial savings that about roughly accurate, would um, you say? Actually, it was a little bit more. What, the $300,000 was just the maintenance program alone, but um, mm. so. yeah, it's just one well, that's it fine. was a lot of money. I mean, and there's no, there's no question that earlier this spring there's one that got by us, you know, at a middle management layer. We, we all know what happened, um, we've, and we've fixed that procurement issue. Uh, it, the, the sale of the three trucks, at, again, following the old policy, Handled at middle layers, according you know almost to the book, did result in a in a sale that was probably several thousand less than it should be. I think we all acknowledge that. We've done everything we can to fix it. Um, well, I should put that down for a five thousand dollar increase, a bonus, be, uh, not bonus, but we made five thousand dollars because when I got the truck back, they were, some of them were fixed. Oh right, so, so I'll add that. <laughs> I mean, yeah. So I mean, you know, mistakes mistakes are going to happen, and when they do, you know, the the what counts is you knuckle down and fix it. And I think we did. Uh, it doesn't mean it didn't happen, um, but it we fixed it, and the policy has been fixed after however many decades it was in place. Uh, and there will be surely other mistakes in the future. Um, um, hopefully I hope not. not. I hope not. I mean, people are human, I and uh, I just hope that anybody who's on town meeting or on the selectmen or in town hall knows that you know, we all want to work together and do a good job. Right. And um, hopefully we can meet with the selectmen. And One of the things that I find interesting, and you know, being around a long time, I, I, maybe I'm in a rut from the past, but now that we're trying to move from reactionary to proactive, I think is a very good thing. You know, and, and I'm kind of excited about the direction we're now going at this point. So, yeah. you know, and being 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 the old dinosaur here, <laughs> you know, well, I, I, I certainly think. like to see if I could comment. I'd also like to think that we could become a role model for the rest of the community. I mean, in terms of being proactive and right. these, you know, obviously there's not translation between tell you know polls and mm -hmm. and what happens in the school department, but there are things in terms of policy issues that we're dealing with and have dealt with. That are replicatable, and I think if we address them, then others should be able to address them as well. I just want to say something quickly from what Patty said. Just so you know, I have had uh, senior staff meetings, division staff meetings, yeah. and a company wide staff meeting to discuss the reliability study right. and the organizational study so that uh, you know fear factors or whatever are put into the, the proper perspective. 
yes, we do want to have the appropriate amount of people. We want to have them skilled uh, to be able to do the job and to meet the future, especially with, with sales being flat. It's very important that we have the right organizational structure. And you know, that's not intended to scare anybody, but we want the wages to be accurate and, and within ranges and um, you know, this so that we can keep be and stay the third, you know, second or third lowest rate in the state. I mean, that is the, the point. Um, so I just wanted to let it, everyone know that staff has is there and will continue to let them know to guide them through this so that, uh, you know, everyone can stay on track. But I, I don't think there's going to be much, much disruption. I think everybody has gotten the heads up. Yeah, I think, well, it's good that you did that because I, that did resonate with me because I think in most organizations, the reality is when companies do those studies and benchmarking, uh, the end result does sometimes end up in cost reductions that could be in, in a variety of areas, but it's good that you're talking to them because mm -hmm. I think it's right. just the human, the human being is always thinking about the worst case, <laughs> right? They, they're probably well, going to do it, but yeah. good communications yeah. and doing that uh, kind of staves that off because they know that it's a, an effort to improve, not an effort to reduce cost. Isn't right. that a, a mm -hmm. message? Okay. Okay. Any further discussion? Um, I guess we now are, have the general manager re report. Um, I wanted to just let everyone know that I sent, um, now is the time of year where a lot of the commercial and municipals uh, will ask us for input for a budget for FY16, um, you know, because they're putting the, together their budgets. And um, we sat down with integrated resources and we, um, we put together, we, we just made sure that the six-year financial budget plan and the forecasted projections for power supply were in line. And we sent out uh, an email to Barbara LaShare, and I spoke to him again this morning uh, in the staff meeting. About three to five percent increase in power supply. We're not at this time projecting any base rate increase for FY16. Um, you should know, though, that this quarter we were down three percent in sales. That's probably most likely because of the weather. The summer was not very hot. Mm. We did have a cold a cold winter and snap back. We're watching it and um, as I make this uh, my rounds through the different selectmen and town managers over the next month and a half for the next um, presentations that I'm making, I will let them know the same type of thing that they can expect a three to five percent on power supply which is a pass through but that there is some volatility there and we're analyzing it every month and if there's any change we'll let them know as soon as possible. We can't always control, you know, especially the train, and, and let them know it as well. The transmission and capacity is going up in 17 and 18 pretty significantly. But they all have copies of the six year. Well, especially right. considering that NSTAR announced a 37% increase. Right. I mean, 37%, that's staggering. And I happen to be one of their customers in another location, <laughs> so it's real. I mean, it's not, it, yeah. it's just unbelievable. Mm -hmm. right. Wow. Yeah. Phenomenal. Yeah, why is that? Why is theirs 37 and ours is? Well, they they don't have long-term contracts because they're deregulated, so they go out every six months, and they, they project ahead and reconcile for any losses that they had in the past. So some of the 37% might be mm -hmm. that they under-collected over the last six months, mm -hmm. right. but um, mm -hmm. it's, it doesn't mean <coughs> that it's going down. It right. just means that uh, they've been ramping up, and you know they have to pay their share of the capacity and transmission as well. So we're happy to keep it low here. Yep. Great. Is that was that it for your report? Was the report? Yep. Oh. That's it. Oh, sorry. Yep. Good. Any uh, any further discussion? Do we know anything about the appointment of a uh, our fifth member? Um, no, not yet. I have not contacted, or we have not contacted town. All to we have to list it first, as I understand it. I mean, has it not been not been listed at this point? I mean, I don't believe it's been listed. Okay, can we? I can talk to the town clerk and, and inquire. Right? Would you inquire I on would that? Have, that would have been an automatic thing. I, I, I 
I know under the charter there's there's certain time periods of which to do that. So I don't know what what we need to do, and if you the department will look into that for us, please. Absolutely. I'd like to get a we should get a fifth member. I believe we have some people who are interested. At least one that I know of. Yeah. Hmm? Hmm. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Okay. Okay. So then our next meeting will be. Uh, Wednesday, November 12th, and again Thursday, December 11th. Is that right? Yep. Is it possible that we could set the meeting on a certain day each month? Like the th we used to do it the third Wednesday, then we went to the fourth Wednesday. Can we get back to that? Because we seem kind of a rat. Well, Thursday schedule. Fourth Wednesday, Thursday. We are on Thursday. Well, I understand that. I understand that. But what? Do you mind coming in for Thanksgiving? Oh, sure. Are you serving turkey? Well, I understand that. But you know, it would be nice if we get to like a regular meeting. I feel like we're kind of mismatched a little bit. I don't know if it's just my own personal feeling, but I feel like we're mismatched in terms of setting the meeting dates. Maybe we should set. You know, pick pick a night. But it's a third Fourth, th fourth Thursday, uh, starting in January, we'll do the fourth Thursday. Is that yeah. the 29th? Instead of being the financial report, we have like there are Thursdays, we don't always have the financial Right, report. right. Yeah. So but I'd like in my own mind to get it. As of January, get it January, January. Yeah. Yeah. fourth yeah. Thursday. That, we just, okay. Right, okay, yeah. that's fine. Thank you, um, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can I make a comment about, I mean, Dave's not here, so since we're trying to <laughs> have better communication on CAB, um, they had some policies at their last meeting that they gave to me, and I've included them in the legal scrubbing that got sent out with the rest of yeah. the policies. CAB's own policies? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's fine. Great. As a, as a way to help out. Right. Yeah. And, and I'll fine. need a, another policy committee um, meeting to go over policies 9 and 19, which are your next procurement ones that are yep. um, done and ready. So that we'll continue through all 30 of them, but we'll have to have. Um, okay. Should we schedule that now? Or um, do you want to have it? Days, yeah. Well, do you want to just have it before the thir December 11th meeting? Uh, the hour before the December 11th meeting? Are you ready? Yes, I guess. That's good. Okay. Yeah. okay. Would you want to do it in a, in a morning like we did before? Mm -hmm. Not really, but okay. if, if you do, no, I'd, good. I'd, I'd rather just do it the hour before. Well, it's just, you know, we had the meeting just for, you know, tonight before this meeting, and we seemed like we were running up against a deadline. Well, do you think an hour is enough to do the policy committee meeting? Well, I'm going to send the policies out for you to look at um, Good thought. So okay. I think we can good probably good thought. Get it good thought. Good thought. Let's take the year. Good thought. Good thought. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. <coughs> Very good. Much more efficient. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we'll do it. The, we'll do it the hour before. Yeah. Six thirty, December eleventh, for the policy committee, and then seven thirty for the. Right. Let's meeting. hope it doesn't rain and there's not a lot of traffic. <laughs> <laughs> or take the train, <laughs> which I do. Uh, and uh, work from home. Uh, and you know what? I don't want. I don't want the computer in my home. <laughs> I'll drive to my office. <laughs> and there's a citizens advisory board meeting November nineteenth, so Wednesday. Who's covering that? Do we know? Do we have a? Do we? What? When is that? November. November nineteenth. So. I, I can cover that one. Okay. I, th I think it's been a while since I've been there. Anyway, I think Tom got the last one. Yeah. Yeah. So. <coughs> Has North Reading appointed a new member? No. Okay. Um, okay. I think we are adjourned. Or are we going? Do we need to? Do we need to? I don't think something? we need to. No. No. Okay. no. So I'll move. I'll move, Mr. Chairman, to adjourn. Okay. Second. All in favor? Uh, that's four to zero. The mo uh, meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now, if I remember correctly, this is.